This is what two college degrees gets you. Have a seat. Good to see you guys this morning. How's everybody doing? Awesome. It's so great to have you here with us this weekend. Glad you're here on this beautiful weekend. And uh, if you're just joining us, uh, we've been in a series the last few weeks where we're journeying through this little small book that's kind of tucked away in the New Testament of the Bible called Philippians. And if you've missed a week or two or you've not been here, maybe you're here for the first time, I can't encourage you enough. Go back and catch the messages online on our YouTube channel, through our website, our app. Our pastor, Bill Clark, has been knocking it out of the park. This has been such a great series, and I, I really want to encourage you to check that out. But if you're kind of new to the Bible, what I want to say out of the gate is that this book is really not a book. It's more of a letter. And uh, it's a letter that was written by this guy named Paul. Uh, and if you've never read the Bible, Paul was what you would call an apostle, which is just a really big word um, uh, for a guy who had been called by God to kind of be this messenger to get the good news out to the world. The good news that Jesus Christ had come to the world to give his life for everybody. And that through him, we could all last forever. And he's writing to this uh, new group of believers, new group of Jesus followers that he loved very, very deeply. They had planted a church together uh, in this little area called Philippi. Hence the letter to the Philippians. Just like you and I might receive a letter to the Independentians, right? Or the Erlangerites or the Rabbit Hashians, depending on where you live. But we would get that kind of letter. And this letter, what I want you to know actually is to us. And it's been preserved in God's word and it's a letter that I really believe with all my heart gives us some of the richest, most helpful stuff you'll find anywhere on the planet uh, for how to live a great life. In it, we're going to see that verse by verse by verse, Paul is doing everything he can to try to help us capture the secret to having great joy. And that's something that if we're honest, we all just continue to chase in this life. But the ironic thing about this joyride kind of letter is it was written from prison, of all places. You read this letter, it's just oozing joy, and you go, this guy wrote this letter from all places? Prison? It'd be like me attempting to write a joy-filled letter while enduring an episode of The Bachelor. <laughs> or it'd be like me trying to write a joy-filled letter while entering into the third hour of a distant relative's birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese, Right? And so you read this and you're thinking, a letter dripping with joy from prison? And as you read it, you would think that Paul Shirley, while he's writing this letter, is kind of playing a blues harmonic, like, don't down, down, down. I'm chained to this God, down, 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 down. the food here is really bad, right? Like this kind of just negative, Debbie Downer, woe is me kind of letter. And on top of that, writing from a place that he did not rightfully belong. But instead, it is the most joy-filled, hope-filled, life-giving kind of letter you may ever read. I mean, in this little book, 16 different times, Paul uses the word joy or the word rejoice. Demonstrating over and over again that joy really has nothing to do with your circumstances. It's something that runs so much deeper than that. And today, we're going to hang out together uh, in a section of that letter that I really believe holds the key to uh, not only having stellar relationships, but having this deeply joy-filled kind of life. And it's a section where my man Paul, he's, he's going to take us uh, on a joyride. Now, when I think of a joyride, my mind completely goes to some time in my Jeep. I'm a Jeep owner. We do the weird wave and the ducks and all that kind of crazy stuff. When I think about a joyride, I think about being in my Jeep, on like the perfect day. Empty calendar, nothing to do, perfect weather, not a cloud in the sky, top down, wind blowing through my... <laughs> Tunes cranking, right? I mean, you know what it is to like, you ever car sing when your jam comes on? Car singing is kind of like shower singing. You know, you go into Hobby Lobby and you see all those things that have quotes all over them. They have that one quote that says, dance like no one's watching. Love like you've never been hurt. Sing like no one's listening. 
That's what I'm doing in these moments, right? It is open road and open mouth. And I was having one of those moments back in the spring. It was a little after Toby Keith had passed away. I know we're in church. This guy didn't write hymns. Any Toby Keith fans? Country? Yeah. I love Toby Keith. And so I had kind of a playlist of some of his music. And I'm rocking down kind of the, some of the rural roads of Boone County. And I'm just singing those classics. Songs like As Good As I Once Was and How Do You Like Me Now and Red Solo Cup and A Little Less Talk and A Lot More Action. And then all of a sudden, I catch myself belting out these lyrics to one of his hits. Here's what I was singing. I want to talk about me, want to talk about I, want to talk about number one, oh my, me, my, what I think, what I like, what I know, what I want, what I see. I want to talk about me. <laughs> and I thought, that's probably on too many people's playlists, <laughs> including mine. In fact, it's some people's theme song. But you think, man, if I could just make life all about me, then I would finally be happy. And on the surface, that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, it really does. But can I ask you, has that been your experience <laughs> so far on this journey? Paul wants to make sure in this letter that we all know that joy is actually found in something else. So let's pick up here together at the beginning of Philippians 2, verses 1 through 5. Look what it says with me. Paul says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Paul's saying, friends, <laughs> listen to me. This thing called joy, it's actually found in something else. It's actually found in being second. Or let me say it this way, it's actually found in getting over yourself. And we know that self is especially difficult to get over in this culture, right? Because <laughs> you and I, we live day in and day out in this it's all about me kind of world. I was doing some research this past week on selfies. <laughs> the selfies came on the scene about when the iPhone 4 came out. That was a big deal because that phone was the first one that had the front facing camera and the selfie took off. And for the last 10 years, you and I know that social media has created kind of this on-ramp for selfie obsession. I recently read that about 90 million selfies are taken a day. Now, if you live with teenagers, that number might be a little low, <laughs> right? Google said that last year over 24 billion selfies were uploaded to their site. 24 billion. We're constantly just taking pictures of ourselves. <laughs> and if you had told any of us in this room five, ten years ago that, that that's what we'd be doing now, just taking random pictures of ourselves, we would have said, that's the most ridiculous thing ever. But that's just kind of what we do now. Hey, hashtag candy corn and leggings, <laughs> right? Or you know, the people on their vacation where you're working and they're showing the picture of them reading their book by the pool with their feet. I'm like, I don't want to see your feet. You're nasty, and I hate your vacation. No, I'm teasing, right? But this is, this is kind of what we do now. We just take random pictures of ourselves because we assume, I know everybody wants to see me eating this piece of pie at Frisch's, right? Hashtag awesome, right? Right? And do you remember when the, when the selfies like first came out? Do you remember these things that started showing up? You'd be in line at Kings Island like to ride the beast, and there's some guy with a group about ready to put your eye out with one of these, these selfie sticks. They were like everywhere. And this thing just got crazier and crazier and crazier. Then on top of that, there's a whole other category known as selfies gone wrong. There are people who have committed crimes and thought it'd be a smart idea while they're shoplifting to take a picture of themselves, post it online, and then the police show up later that night at their home. 
There was a guy I read about this summer who called in sick to work because of a family emergency. <laughs> that day he went to an end of the summer lake party and took selfies of himself, pounding the brewskis, getting hammered, posted them online, and that night I had a text from his boss that said, see me first thing in the morning. <laughs> There's even a tragic number of examples of death by selfies. In the last two years, over 50 people have died trying to take the perfect selfie. That's more than death by a shark. That's crazy. <laughs> but that's the world we live in now. And it reminds us that there's just all kinds of problems that occur when we start to point the camera to ourselves. When we start making ourselves what we're focused on. And my man Paul here, he couldn't agree more. And his letter to us throughout this book, it's, it's just kind of one big mic drop when it comes to joy. Now, I don't know about you, but I think when it comes to the word joy, it's a word that's always kind of blurry for us. We think we kind of know what it is, but we're not sure. We go, is that kind of like happiness? What's the difference between the two? So I went out of the gate, kind of nail down some distinction and help us define these things. Let's talk about happiness first. Okay, and this is on the screen. Here's what happiness is. Happiness is based on what is happening to me and around me. It's an emotion. 100% it's a feeling. And it's totally dependent on what is happening around me. It drives that, what I feel. Paul, though, comes along here in Philippians. And he says, joy, <laughs> way different. This is how today we're going to see Paul begin to really define joy. He says joy is this. It's actually choosing to have the same mindset as Jesus. He's like, I hate to burst your bubble, but it's really not an emotion or a feeling. We'll say, I've said it too, I just feel so much joy. Paul say, eh. It's really not that. It's really something so much more. It's choosing to have the same mindset as Jesus. And if you read the Bible and get to know Paul, man, everything for him was about Jesus. And he's saying in his letter, I want you to think like Christ. Proverbs 23, 7, look at this verse with me. It says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. The Bible's saying, look, what we think determines who we become. Paul's saying, joy, it's not this feeling or this emotion. It's a mind shift. Joy is a mind shift that really has nothing to do at all with your circumstances. And that first mind shift we're going to see from Paul on this joy ride of getting over ourselves is this. And that is if you think like Jesus thought, you'll live like Jesus lived. If you begin to think like Jesus thought, you're going to begin to live like Jesus lived. And it's just true when you think about it. Our lives move in the direction of our thoughts. I'll say it again. Our lives, they, they naturally move in the direction of our thoughts. I'm going to put this on the screen to say it this way. Joy is a mind shift where you're choosing to have the same mindset as Jesus. Here's what it is. It's a different way of thinking, which leads to a different way of walking, different way of seeing, just different. And Paul, he, he launches out of the gate with this verse that is a verse I used to have all my couples I was doing premarital counseling with. I'd have them memorize this verse. Here's what it is in verse 3. Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. <laughs> now those two things right there, absolute joy killers. Crazy. Paul says, here's the deal. There's these two kinds of conflict-creating kinds of joy. They're joy killers. And they're called selfish ambition and vain conceit. Now, what do those look like? Here's what they look like. Selfish ambition says, it's all about me. <laughs> Selfish ambition says, it's all about me. And then vain conceit partners right up next to it and says, and I'm always right. It's all about me, and I'm always right. Joy killers. <laughs> Absolute joy killers. Paul's saying, look, in your relationships, don't compete with each other. Don't, don't keep score. Don't have this 
self-seeking motive or agenda. We do this all the time, right? Hey, didn't you see I did the dishes? Right? You saw that, right? I mean, uh, you had the remote last night, remember? I made the bed yesterday morning. It's your turn, sweet cheeks, right? I don't know anybody, I don't know anybody calls anybody sweet cheeks anymore. I don't even know where that came from. But that's not in the Bible. <laughs> Thou shalt be a sweet cheek, right? But it made me think about this couple. Uh, when I used to, to pastor and teach at the same time in schools, and I had this couple, they were about two years into their marriage, and they came to me and said, hey, we're really struggling. Would you meet with us just for some basic kind of marital counseling? And I was like, absolutely. And what I didn't have a heart to say to them is, I am a terrible counselor. <laughs> Horrible counselor. Like, it's just not my gift. But I met with them because I love them, and I just listened. And for like a half hour, I just let them go on and on and on and on. And finally, I went all Dr. Phil on them. I was like, you got to chase it, face it, erase it. Right? I just, I was pulling it all out. And I finally looked at them and I said, time out. Let's just cut to the chase. And I said, you're selfish and you're selfish. Let's pray. <laughs> and I thought in that moment that this big old boy was going to come across the table and eat my lunch. He was mad as a hornet. He did not like that kind of honesty. But in a moment, his countenance all kind of changed. And he looked at me and he said, you know what? You're right. You're right. And a few months later, his wife, with tears in her eyes, she said, you're right. They've been married for over 20 years now, and <laughs> when we see them, he'll joke, remember that night I just wanted to punch you in the face? I'm like, yeah, glory to God, all right. <laughs> Good luck, sweet cheeks, you know. <laughs> but Paul here, he says, listen, don't let selfishness suck the joy out of your relationships. Don't let selfishness wreck your life because it will. These joy killers will. Verses three and four. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Now, the word here in this verse used for value or to honor literally means to attach a high price tag. He's saying value other people. Look at other people and attach a high price tag to all of them. Not some of them. All of them. To all people you come into contact with. And so what that means is we don't get to look at just certain people around us as kind of big lots, clearance rack material when Jesus at the cross declared that every person on this earth is glass case, top of the line Gucci. He declared that at the cross. He says, so look at all people and attach a high price tag to them. And he goes on, he says, and in fact, honor them above yourself. You know who does this so well? Dogs. <laughs> Dogs got this one down. These are a few pictures of our dog, Boone. We just, we just got him back in December. He was a rescue, black lab. And I'll just tell you, I'm in love with this dog. I'll, I'll confess, uh, we have a dysfunctional, codependent relationship. He needs me, and I need him. But dogs and Boone, they got this down. I could be gone for 30 seconds. And I come back in the door and he's like, oh my gosh, where you been? I love you. I've missed you so much. It's been like five years. Just, just touch me, oh great man. Anywhere, everywhere, right there. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. That's the spot. Yes, yes. So when you say, you treat me like a dog, I say, well, I hope so. <laughs> Dogs know how to do this. <laughs> they know how to honor others above themselves. They know how to attach a high price tag. And so it makes me begin to ask, what if, you know? I mean, what if, instead of thinking of people in your life as just kind of clearance rack kind of material, what if we actually attached a high price tag to them? Hear these words again, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, 
not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. I love that scene in Mark chapter 10. Jesus is hanging out with his guys. He's hanging out with his disciples in this upstairs room. They're getting ready to have dinner together. And these grown men, his followers, he's called to follow him in the ministry. They're just arguing, fighting like kids. It's really kind of embarrassing. They're arguing about who's going to go first and who's going to get to be in charge and who's going get to sit, get to sit next to Jesus. And I sat next to him yesterday, and it's been a week since I sat next to him, and I'm back and forth. And Jesus is finally like, fellas, enough. Guys, I love you. Shut it, right? Like, enough. Chill. Guys, stop. And he gives them four words in this passage that I'll be honest with you, they are words that I have to every day Velcro to my heart as I walk through this crazy life. Look what Jesus says beginning in verse 42. It says, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Here it is. Not so with you. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even, he's saying me, <laughs> son of man, didn't come to be served, but to serve. To give his life for a ransom for many. And then he walked out of the room, went to a cross, and proved it. You see, humility in our culture is seen as like this great tragedy. And Jesus comes along and says, not so with you. Not so with you. Jesus says, humility is not this tragic fall. It's actually the beginning of rise to true greatness. And I love what C.S. Lewis says. Look what he says. He says, humility isn't thinking <clears throat> sorry. He says, humility isn't thinking less of ourselves. It's thinking of ourselves less. I love that. It's thinking of ourselves less. Anyone who spends any kind of time with Jesus isn't going to think less of a person that Jesus saw as valuable enough to go to the cross for. <laughs> Please get that this morning, this weekend. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. But friends, I'm just going to tell you, when you start kind of hanging out with Jesus on a daily basis, you just do start thinking of yourself less. Let's keep reading Paul's letter now, what he says next here, beginning in verse 5. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You and I know that the world, we love these rags to riches kind of stories, don't we? The story of the person who had nothing, they pulled themselves up by the bootstraps and through hard work and determination and goal setting, they became this huge success in the world's eyes. We love those kind of stories. But Jesus' story is actually the exact opposite. His story, when you really think about it, it's riches to rags. It's riches to rags. Think about it. He leaves the hells of heaven for the nails of Calvary. He comes down to earth and submits to the will of his father. And I was trying to think all week long, like what is something visually that might help all of us this morning kind of grasp and lock onto the magnitude of this passage? And the image I kept coming back to was just that of a ladder. It's the image that kept coming to my mind because we all know what it is to spend most of our life just 
climbing a ladder. Climbing that ladder of success, significance. We start at the bottom, man, rung after rung after rung. Money, approval, acceptance, accomplishments, attention and praise, keeping up with the Joneses. We climb hard and we work that status. Even sometimes, if we're honest, stepping on the people we need to step on to get there. But Jesus said, he says something totally different. Here's what he says. He says, friends, the way up is down. The way up is down. He's saying, when you follow me, you don't ascend the ladder of greatness. You descend the ladder of greatness. Jesus here, man, he totally redefines greatness and says, greatness, friends, is something you descend into. Jesus. And boy, could he say that with great validity because he came as a bottom rung servant to reveal who God is. Look with me at verses six and seven. It says, who being in very nature God, Jesus, he, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. I love this. Jesus never walked around flashing his God card. <laughs> he never found himself in a conversation and said, um, let me interrupt you, but you know who I am, right? <laughs> right? Never. He could have, but he didn't. Jesus said, even though I could, I'm not going to cling to my divine rights. I'm just not going to do it. Even though I could, I'm not going to power up on people. I'm just not. And there was no hint of grandiosity in him whatsoever. Even though he was fully man and fully God. He came in as much obscurity as anybody ever could. Starting right out of the gate with mangers and cow manure, growing up as a carpenter's son, this little bitty hick town called Nazareth, framing houses, making furniture, just living a quiet, poor, simple life for almost 30 years. And so Paul here, he says, guys, listen, man, greatness looks way different in God's economy. And he gives us another mind shift on this joyride of getting over ourselves. This is what we take from Paul. Here's the second mind shift. That is that serving is not what I do. A servant is who I am. Serving is not what I do. It's, it's just who I am. I'm not caught up in climbing ladders. You have a totally different view for this race of honor and significance. And you start living like Jesus did, who came to serve and not be served. You begin to realize this. Please get this this morning. Greatness doesn't lie in trying to be somebody. Greatness lies in trying to serve somebody. Trying to serve somebody. <laughs> and there's no one better to learn that from than Jesus. Paul's saying, look, every day, like every single day of your life, you got to get up and you have to make a very intentional choice to embrace the same radical approach to humility that Jesus chose. You're walking through this life with the same mindset as Jesus. And Paul's saying, that's, that's joy. It's not a feeling. <laughs> it's not an emotion. It's choosing to walk through this life with the same mindset as Jesus means you roll out of bed every day and you make this conscious decision asking the Holy Spirit to remind you throughout all the day that you are not the center of the universe. You're praying, God, listen, today, just today, help me. In regard to my ego, in regard to my need for self-importance, I choose to have the same mindset as Jesus, who really is the center of the universe. I don't know about you, but... Do you ever read or hear these words of Paul and just ask yourself, how could this guy who was chained 24 hours a day to a Roman guard, awaiting a trial that any day 
could determine the fate of his life, more than likely being found guilty and executed, how could he in the midst of all that mess say something as insanely beautiful as this in Philippians 1? For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. How could he say something like in Acts 20 when he said, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me. How could he in Philippians 3 say, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord? How could this guy chain to this guard 24 hours a day, navigating such unfair circumstances, and Philippians 4 say, hey, do not be anxious about anything. It's all good. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. There were all these reasons that Paul could be absolutely miserable. And there's countless reasons why you and I could be miserable as well. Well, I don't have this, and well, that isn't fair, and I wish this was different. Why didn't God answer this? I deserve more. I deserve better. And the list could go on and on and on and on. How could I ever be joyful when my life isn't the way I want it, tell me how. <laughs> and then Paul comes along and he gives us one final mind shift, which is this. My joy is not based on what happens to me, but what God is doing in me and through me. Paul says, I lost my life to find it. And my joy isn't based on what anybody says to me. It's not based on what anybody does to me. It's not even based on anything that happens to me. It's based on who he is and what he is doing in me and through me. <laughs> Paul's saying, you can lock me up, but you can't shut me up. And finally, in verse 9, Paul says this, Therefore, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and he gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The way up is down. We live in a world filled with people. We've all been there who will do anything and everything to get to the top of the ladder. And when they arrive, when they get there, they're empty, they're jaded, and deeply unsatisfied. And Jesus comes along and says, not so with you. Not so with you. He says, follow me, man. The way up is down. Die to yourself and finally really live. And it's in following his example that we'll finally find this thing called joy. What a ride. <laughs> what a ride. Now, I'm a practical kiss guy. Keep it simple, stupid. So I get to a passage like this and the end of a message, and I go, what do I do with this, right? And if you're like me, a broken, messy, sinful person, I look at these words of Paul in Scripture and go, that sounds great. How do you begin to pull this off? How do, you, how do you do this? And I just keep coming back to this one word that I think is the only way we pull it off. And that is the word surrender. Surrender. Surrender often a word that's connected to defeat, <laughs> losing, game over. But the Christian life is the only place in this world where surrender actually leads to victory. And I think the only way we pull this off is to surrender our life into the potter's hands. Scripture is always giving us this picture of God being the potter and we being the clay. Look at this verse from Isaiah 64, verse 8. It says, we are the clay and you are the potter. We are all formed by your hand. 
You ever see clay be- before it becomes like a bowl or a vase? It's just this earthly material, slimier than mud, kind of nasty. This is big lump. But then in the potter's hands, it's the beginning of something beautiful. The potter takes it, man, he just owns that material and he squeezes and restores and removes some stuff and, and refines. And if you don't get anything else this morning, get what I'm about to say. How do we pull this off? Here's the deal. In his hands, in his hands, we become what we aren't. (laughs) Only in his hands, we become what we aren't and what we think we can't be. How do I pull this off? I surrender my life into the potter's hands who can make me what I'm not and what I think I'll never become. So I'm going to ask you for a moment, would you just bow your heads with me for a moment? I just want you to see that image for a moment of that lump of clay in the potter's hands. It's messy. There's some stuff that really needs to be removed, completely kind of reshaped, prepared, reformed into something different. We've all got some type of a next step to take this morning. Maybe for you, it's, there's a really specific area of your life right now where you're like, I need to place that back into the potter's hands where he can make me what I'm not. What he can make what I think I'll never pull off or become because I can't on my own. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're like, I don't think I've ever really surrendered my life into the potter's hands. I've been kind of doing it all myself. Christ doesn't live in me yet. And so it's hard to pull this off without him living in you because this is an inside out kind of job. And it has to begin with saying, man, there was a time where I invited Christ in my life. Lord, save me, rescue me. I wanna be baptized and begin to do life fully in the potter's hands. And in a moment, I encourage you just with God's nudging and leadership and his quiet, gentle voice, for you to take that next step today, whatever that is for you. You can take that by visiting the next steps table over here. Missy and I will be over there. We would love to pray with you, talk with you, encourage you, tell you how you can invite Christ in your life and be baptized. Or you can do that through the connect card that's on the chair in front of you through the QR code app if you wanna share with us online. But this week, the win of this week isn't this morning, it's what happens now. And as a staff and as a team getting to follow up with you and help you and encourage you as you say, I want to, guys, I want to surrender that to the potter's hands. And so as we begin to worship, remember it's, it's in his hands this morning that we become what we aren't. That he begins to make us what we think we'll never be. It can happen when we're surrendered to the potter's hands.